you know this. Basically, I look at uh, my past, and I, 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 to quote, to quote Brownie McGee, yes. said, uh, "You can't buy my past, and I'll give you nothing for your future." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I woke up this morning. Oh, fucking hell! <laughs> You're not a policeman, are you, bro? Nah, not at all. Not at all, mate. Not at all. Certain resonance to your to your performance? Do you reckon, or I don't know. has, has uh, it changed your performance? No, it hasn't actually. Although, uh, so every now and then, uh, because of the chemo brain, you you forget to do certain things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did a, a, a show where I told the audience all about um, how this song came about, mm -hmm. and then when I finished singing it, I was and realized, wait a minute. The pertinent verse that is supposed to be there, I've forgotten to sing it. <laughs> well, it was originally it's supposed to go. Uh, uh, sometimes when I play my guitar, my eyes get filled with tears, and uh, because there's so many people with preconceived ideas, they've been yeah. listening with their eyes when they should have been looking with their ears. Looking with your ears. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So. Um, because that's all the thing about you got to be black to sing the blues. Right. You see, that's yeah. the stuff I used to cop all the time. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's only a little bit I know about him, but um, personally. You met him? Yeah. I met him the first time in, um, he came in from Melbourne when we were signing in for the blues, uh, blues at uh, Bridgetown. I think it was my second year playing Bridgetown. And he was there. He said, "I'm Dutch Tilders. Uh, I've been I've been doing this a long time around Australia. Now I've been hearing his name from a lot of the other runners, like people like Dave Holt, a good friend of mine. People like Bob Patient, played piano. Uh, some of the um, Melbourne-based musicians, you know, his name always come up. So, and I had a chance to hear him play because I, I was headlining the festival down there." And when you headline, you're trying to get out there to catch as many people as possible. And uh, he had a, had a good groove. To what he was playing. It has some history to it. It has some stories to it. It wasn't just something thrown together. And see, a lot of the other musicians around Australia, if they would take notice of what he did, his work, let his work speak for itself. If you listen and take notice to his work, you'll see that in the long run, just do what Dutch did. Play the music, do the thing that he loved. And just, you know, you know, don't try to look for a gold mine into something that's not that. Be true to the music. Be true to who you are. And, and sing about what you know, I guess. Yeah. You don't have to sing about, you don't have to be from Mississippi or from, why? why? You don't have to be from a cotton field. Why? Yeah, so many people.
It's not the colour of your skin, it's the quality of your music. What I learned from him that it was okay to sound like a black guy. in Portland in the Max Hotel. Um, I wagged the day off school so I'd get down there early. You know, uh, he'd had a long drive from the last gig he'd done. And I would say, uh, a young guy full of silly questions. And yeah, he came across as cranky old bastard. You know? <laughs> yeah, he had a heart of gold, but he, but he uh, yeah, he, he just, sort of covered it up with this this gruff persona. Um, he was the toughest guy I knew, you know, I, I can say that with all, uh, with, without a doubt. He was, he, was the, he was the toughest motherfucker I ever met. Mm. And, um, uh, yeah, a certain amount of bravado, but he could back it up. Mm. Um, he was a fighter. Yeah, yeah, he really was. I've seen Dutch just gently put his guitar down when he's been heckled and walk out into a crowd and knock someone out, you know, like, he had a really dark side to him. I noted that in, in him. Yeah. There was, a, there, was a, there was a dark side, you know, like, I mean, if you know, I'll fucking smack you in the mouth of a fucking, you fucking prick, you know, like, you know, if he, if, if he got a bit fucking shirty and, you know, yeah, yeah. somebody was a bit of a fucking asshole to him, I'm... Yeah. Like, he'd have the odd, he'd have the odd, you know, uh, temper, uh, um, not tantrum, but he, he certainly had a, had a side to him. You didn't mess with the Dutchman. Oh, oh. Okay, comrades, let's hear it for the King of Australia, Blues, Mr. Dutchman. Oh, 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 oh. And what is it about the blues that, um, how did you get into the, into the blues in particular? I have no idea. No? I have no idea. It's a bit like, it's a bit like you meet three girls. Mm. All three of them are gorgeous. Mm. But yeah, you fall for one of them. Yeah, because she, she's your taste. Yeah. And the blues was your mistress. That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's been a good mistress. Ah, oh, she's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun playing that music. Yeah. I've had a lot of, Wonderful people. Yeah, I, I did a show with him. Wow. We played a lot of the same festivals. Really? So you played with him more than once? Yeah, on the, on the same same stages, but there was one private show I did, and we, we, yeah, he was there. It was really cool. I heard a lot about him and, and saw some stuff of him and, and listened to him. Yeah. And then, 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 then see him and meet, you know, meet him. And yeah. It was really cool. Um, I got a booking down near Canberra, south side of Canberra, it's a place called Rose Cottage. Funky old building, and it's sort of a rundown sort of building in a really cool way, and uh, Bucky booked me down there and said, do you want to play with Dutch Tilders? And I said, hell yeah. 
He's one of my heroes from my younger days, you know, we used to watch him on TV a lot. Getting to know, Getting to know. Yeah. GTK. <laughs> used to come on sort of around about quarter to seven, something like that? Or? Half past six. Half past six, was it? Uh, on Friday night. It was too, because then there was Bellbird for 15 Bellbird. minutes afterwards. That's right, there was Bellbird. So we had it half past six, <laughs> ten minutes of that, that's right, Bellbird. And yeah. then on Friday we got a full half hour. <laughs> so it went till seven o'clock. And it was fucking brilliant. It was just, it was the shit we grew up on. It, oh, yeah. In the, in the 15 minutes yeah. that you'd have, there'd be two live acts, wasn't there? There would be two, two live acts yep. and then a little bit of something in the middle, a little bit of, I can't remember what it was. Uh, but the, the, the guy would sort of speak something yeah. about something. Or a bit of an but there'd always be sort of two live acts. You two know, live so, acts. Uh, and some of them sort of in the studios over in, uh, where was it, done Melbourne or Sydney? Melbourne. Melbourne? Yeah. And they were done live in the in the studios, you know. And it was, you would see all these great bands, you know, Tam and Shad and and uh, Masters Apprentices, oh, Masters yeah. Apprentices, Airs Rock, um, um, you no, name uh, it. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the Dingoes, I'm sure. Oh yeah, the uh, actually, was, uh, might have towards the end seen the Dingoes, but it was probably uh, the forerunner. It was Carson. Carvis Duke, um, Carson. It was before then. Carson, yeah. Carson, yeah, yeah. Chain. Oh, and it was it was where we all cut our teeth on sort of uh, on on sort of music. It was like wow. Look at this stuff, Billy. Oh, fucking fantastic. Yeah. Just at least once fucking a week. Fucking fantastic. Just, just <laughs> Live in the studio. Australian music was fucking just happening. I think it's terribly missed, and I know that um, no, it affected a lot of people very deeply. There there's a, there's a, a show on uh, public television down in Melbourne. Guitar gods and and they did a they did a special on with that long, long, long interview and I've seen it. It's, it's awesome. really good. You know, they just they were just sort of touching the surface of it. Very interesting. Really. And I noticed that uh, more hair falls out of my head yeah. than it does from my whiskers. Yes, that's it. Because whiskers are a slower growing hair. Really? There you go. <laughs> I they think. wouldn't think it because you have to shave every day. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, it doesn't grow much. Uh, yeah, yeah. Fucking simple as the act to get all your old girlfriends feeling sorry for you. Well, <laughs> your old girlfriends would be flocking around, wouldn't they? Yeah. Well, I'm an endangered species now. Everybody wants a piece of me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's, what's that like? Uh, what is it like? Yeah. Well, what's, what's, what's it like being, because of course your place in the in the pantheon of, of blues is, is, is a shore. What, what's it like being a bit of a of uh, I take all that with a great assault, you know. I mean, yes, we well you know. would. Uh, see, when I was young, and all I wanted to do was, I wanted to be, I wanted to be rich and unknown. Rich and unknown. Yeah, but it all went the wrong way around. I became. <laughs> Very well known and not rich. <laughs> Dutch had an ego bigger than this room, but that doesn't really matter. <laughs> it goes with it, comes with the territory, maybe. Sorry? Probably comes with the territory. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, um, Dash believed in what he was doing and he did it the way he believed it. Mm. And um, he did it his own way, you know. <laughs> so what, did you have a plan when you first. No, I never had no plans. I, no. I lived every every day I lived mm. for the day. Yes. And I've never had a plan in my life. No. <laughs> you plan not to plan? Well, what's the point? I yeah. mean, you know, uh, plants of mice and men and all that. What's the point of planning when anything can get in the way? Absolutely. So just let it fall, fall your way there. That's what I've always done. And That's right cool. now I'm living every day yep. as best I can. Uh, have as always, much fun as I could possibly have. You've probably always done that, haven't you? Exactly what I've always done, but I do a bit more, uh, a bit more vehemence now. Do you? Because the days are being shortened, you know, yes. like the, the the amount of days, you know. Yeah, so the appreciation's <laughs> intensified. Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm not a blues man, you know. No. Like as you, as you've just fucking <laughs> stumbled upon, it's, you know. It, it's, it's, uh, but he was a, uh, he was a bit more than that, you know. And of course, you played with a lot of good guitar players. Jeff Atchison. Yeah. Thank you. 
I was just a kid, really. I'm still amazed that you know, when Martin uh, decided to, to move on, um, I'm still amazed that of all the guitar players in town that, that, that I got asked to, to come and you know, do a gig. I was never asked to join the band if Is I wanted right? to join. I, no, I, ne and I never, never joined the band, but I think everyone in the blues club possibly had a similar thing. It's just like, you know, you just happened to be you know, the, the one that was coming along to the Monday night jams at the time when, you know, the Dutch needed someone for the gig, you know, that week or, or whatever. I guess it was being asked along for the really important things like the screening of that uh, ABC special. Yeah, and I, I, I can't recall how that was, you know, at that stage how that was booked, you know, whether I got the phone call just for that gig. In, in, because it was pretty early on of, of, of my time playing in the band. I, I didn't really feel I was part of the band at that point. Um, but it was still like, like I'm filling in for Martin. <laughs> uh, Martin Cooper. Yeah. It's, uh, people like, uh, well, Mojo Webb. It's a whole bunch of uh, damn good guitar players about. Mm. But I don't like them to get too smart because, you know, mm. they're supposed to make me sound good. Mm. That's mm. the thing. You know. Which Chris did the other night. Chris Finnan. That's another one, yeah. Uh, Mr. Finnan might join me and Mr. Blight. You never know. Uh, that's it. We're, we can pry them away from a bar somewhere. Or... or uh, <laughs> pry, pry them away from something. Yeah, he's a, he's a funny player, that... Chris, 
He can't help himself sometimes. He's got to do those funny little things, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> avenue of exploration or how does it work musically what the music i'm into yeah are we filming this now are we yes okay <laughs> Chris, he's, he's such a smart man, uh, he can play just about anything mm. on things with strings, mm. you know, plays banjo, uh, strange European, Eastern European and Indian things, mm. and good percussionist too. Is he? Yeah, yeah he's a very, very talented man, mm. but his, his taste in music is so damn Catholic, you know, I don't know where he is half the time. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it runs through Celtic, through Scottish, yeah, yeah. through through uh, uh, European sounds, Indian sounds, yeah. blues sounds, jazz sounds, yeah. uh, all of it, you know. Like, a lot of influences. You can't call him a blues guitarist. He's a damn good guitarist. Damn good guitarist, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When I first saw Dutch, was on television. I saw him on television before I met him in... In, in real life, so um, I liked his guitar playing because I've always loved guitar, and, it, and he, he, he has such a great right hand, uh, it has just great finger picking. And um, but it was his voice; it was, it was purely and simply was his voice. It was just so big and rich, and uh, and you could always understand what he was singing. Mm. Um, and his phrasing. Uh, as a musician myself, I just, obviously, uh, when it comes to blues, um, there are things about the music that excite you, and, and part of that is the edge. We, even if you know what the lyrics there, there'd be of songs he'd, I'd hear him sing, I wouldn't know them, and other ones that I would know, because they're traditional songs. But he didn't sound to me ever like he was copying somebody. He might have had influences from people, and they were undeniable, and you could hear them. But whenever I heard Dutch sing, what I heard was Dutch. I mean, nowadays it's very popular for people to have uh, cover bands and go and copy stuff. I never heard Dutch really copy, not in the not in a complete from A to Z sense. I mean, when you play the blues, you all all of us copy because of the nature of the music, you, where you have to learn it from. But the uh, the, the challenge is to Make it your own. Taste. You were a Catholic, is that right? When you're in the seminary? Uh, yeah, I was in there. Yeah, I was a Catholic. Yeah. yeah. And what did he say? He was doing a priesthood oh. one time. Oh, okay. I went out one Sunday morning, having a scotch, and he was oh, sitting on the fun. piano. <laughs> I don't know, just come out of the blue and I thought, what? I said, what, am I here to confess? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, all right, so he played a bit of piano for me. So, uh, <laughs> I, was, I was fortunate enough, I got to hear him quite often playing the piano. It was excellent. <laughs> 
always down Chris's in Isaac's room. Yeah. Got a little piano in there. To, uh, it was Sunday mornings when I'd go down and pick him up. A Dutch would go in there and we'll go in there and he'd play the piano for me. Right. <laughs> oh, it's fucking beautiful. Really good right. stuff. Yeah. Now, and you spent a year in the seminary? Uh, not quite. Not, not quite a year. I told you I got expelled. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. But uh, that would have been um, uh, that would have been an in interesting time, I, I, I guess. Did you think, I guess, deeply, I guess, about a lot of things while you're doing that? Well, as, as a young man. Yeah. The only thing that pissed me off there was that I wanted to keep on studying the piano, mm. and they insisted that uh, no, they had plenty of piano players in in the school. Mm. Uh, I should learn to play the cello. From there on in, I never went back to piano, and I, I'd like I like I'd like to play a little boogie on a piano every now and then, but I I really can't play the piano. Mm. You know, I should have been able to uh, keep studying piano, but I never did. Which is a shame because um, I love piano. Mm. Yeah, I like playing the blues on a piano. You know, just yeah, yeah. but I can only play in two keys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You on, on the camera about <clears throat> some of those harmonica plays that you played with, because of course that's you played with some greats. Well, the first the first person I ever played with was 1962. That was uh, Shane Duckham. Yep. Uh, kind of legendary now, uh, yep. because he'd be one of the first ones that actually knew anything about playing uh, blues harmonica. Yes. Um, and. Uh, He's gone to God now. He he he, uh, he he died many years ago. Yeah. He's probably murdered. They reckon it was suicide. But uh, yeah, he's supposed to have stabbed himself in the heart. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's a difficult thing to do, as far as I remember. Mm. Well, I've never tried it, but I can just imagine it's difficult to stab yourself in the heart. I think yeah. somebody gave me. That's the word. That's like a dizzy. Uh, <laughs> Queensland police up there. All oh, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He did enjoy good stimulating conversation, and, and and he wasn't beyond a bit of a stir. So I think sometimes he could put put out something that was quite opinionated mm. for the sake of getting the fish to bite back, and getting a reaction, and therefore getting more conversation. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, Shane Duckham, yeah. and then it took me quite a long while to find another one. Yeah. And I'd come back to Melbourne then. Uh, from, this was in Sydney, you know. Come back to Melbourne then, and uh, came across Jimmy Conway. Mm -hmm. Still one of the finest harmonica players in the country, because I toured with him and Brian McGee, mm -hmm. and uh, Brad Smith. Mm -hmm. He's on two of my recordings. He was actually on the the the, 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 the 1972 recording for Bootleg. He's on that. And uh, Ian Collard, yeah, and uh, there's a uh, Steve Sepro. Mm -hmm. He's a very good player. He's on a couple of my recordings. <coughs> and uh, I met uh, Dave Blight uh, a few years ago, mm -hmm. and I always enjoy his playing. Yeah. How'd you meet Dave? Um, through Rock, the Rocket Rob Riley. Uh, the thread sort of goes back to... Can we get these tunes done before you begin your... your uh, no, it's just a, a reminiscence, that's all. He just wanted to capture it now. Uh, it'll, only, it'll only take a sec. Um, the, the thread sort of goes back a little bit further um, than that too, because it was like um, playing with, um, with John Freeman. John, of course, was married to, to, to Sue, who was married to Dutch. And so I knew sort of about Dutch through, through Sue. But I'd never, and, and I think I, I might have, that, that was the other thing. And I mean, and, and John Freeman hung around with, uh, with Peter Howe. Uh, and that's how all that sort of came about, you know, back then, about 1980, 81, something like that. Then of course, Doc Spain up in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. Another player. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, from there on in, uh, a lot of them were very much the same after that, mm. you know.
for their special guy? Oh, there was, there was always a, a, a very good player, Ron King, yeah. from the Four Day Riders. Oh, yeah. And I'll not forget him. Yeah. They had a, he has a, a, a very nice style. He doesn't play too many notes and he mm. just gets that tone right and mm. melodic, you yeah. know. He's very clever at that. Mm. Yeah, there was a, used to be a fellow called Anthony Harkin. Uh, I think he went to Ireland. Mm. He used to jam with me at the uh, Windsor Castle, and I actually had to teach him and said, look, 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 when you get to the tonic, don't suck it, you flatten it. Mm -hmm. So blow it, it gets rid of air at the same time. Yep. Took him a while to learn that one. Yep. And from there on in, he just played so many notes, I couldn't tell what the hell he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he played far too many notes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he was good at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but far too many notes of my like it. Yes, yes. Mm. Yeah, you're like a harmonica player who doesn't want to take over the show. Well, that was another problem with him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he'd, he'd be singing, he'd be going, that helps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, from what I've seen, that's probably a little bit of a tendency. The, the, particularly the harmonica player who uh, who turns up and says, you know, can I get up and. Oh, yeah, you would get them, yeah. Mm -hmm. they are, they're generally called harmonica owners. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. The epitome of a gentleman is somebody who stands in the audience with a harmonica in his pocket mm -hmm. and leaves it there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. a tune for it. We had a, we had a, uh, I used to do the regular thing at the station hotel on a Sunday afternoon. We had, uh, there was a guy in there mm. and he'd come right up to the front. Mm. And he'd play any, no matter what key we were in, he'd play this one harmonica, mm -hmm. you know. And it was annoying to me because I could hear what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And I started to sing out of tune to him, <laughs> oh. you know. And that, that is a really bad thing, you yeah. know. And anyway, I asked him several times to put the bloody thing away, but now, nah, there he was. Goodness me. One of the bikies that was there, I saw him sidle up alongside him. <laughs> and he put the thing away. <laughs> and I, I saw, I saw Mark later, and I said, "What, uh, what you say to him?" I said, "If you don't put that thing back in your fucking pocket, I'll stick it up your fucking ass." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he meant it. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Bob we had just arrived in the Manhattan and Dutch walked in and started chatting to us and Phil Manning came up and said Dutch play with me and Dutch said I haven't bought my guitar and when he says use mine I've got, got another one you know and the two of them played there were about 300 bikies in the, in the mat at the hat and they played and they were facing away from each other they played perfectly together synchronized perfectly and they played classical blues just like a sort yeah. of you know, it was really, really good. Yeah. And everybody was silent and watching intensely. And I thought, oh, this is not good. And I thought, oh, geez, what's going to happen? And as I watched, and they finished perfectly together, and everybody in the band just stood up and applauded. The Vikings and everything. Oh, wow, they liked it, you know? Yeah. Oh, they liked They loved it. You know, it was one of those classic music moments. You get them, there's a few that I've seen, that was one of them. <laughs> Thank you. 
I just always loved the man and his music, and he was just such a, an exponent of. Um, I know you, you like C.W. Stone King, you know. Well, Dutch was the original version of that in a lot of ways. He was the man, you know. He had this stuff down. Yeah, I feel so good. Part of Holland did you come over from? Oh, a place called uh, Nijmegen. When I last saw it, my playgrounds were war ruins. Yeah. That was That's my playground. Fifty-five. Yeah. We used to play uh, allies and Germans instead of Indians and cowboys. Allies. Well, you Bang. In fact, <laughs> there was one of the, the bridges there that they fought over, wasn't it, with the paratroopers? There was the uh, the bridge too far. Yeah. The bridge too far, with, with Arnhem, the Wild River. I think it was also Nijmegen, wasn't it? Nijmegen was the bridge too far. It was the bridge too far. Yeah, that was that was the one. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that was the bridge too far. Yeah. And uh, that's uh, that was at the time. Uh, at one time, it was the longest single span in the world. Yeah. And Sydney Harbour Bridge beats it by about oh, I don't know, a couple hundred meters or something. Is that right? Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. There you go. And uh, what what are your memories of uh, of the war? Oh, the war, not much, because uh, 1944, uh, when the city was, the city centre was smashed to pieces, yeah. uh, I was in a place called Wieke. Yeah. See, my father was in the underground and he knew it, he knew uh, the place was going to get bombed. Yeah. And uh, so we got on our push bikes and yeah. went to stay with an uncle and auntie yeah. Yeah. Uh, in a village outside. And mm. when we came back, well, our house is still standing, but uh, mm. uh, most of the damage was done yeah. in that centre where now they have that square. Yes. Square 44. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, fabulous place. That uh, commemorates the, the 44, the damage of 1944. And there was always a, a, an argument about who the hell actually did the bombing, and it was actually the British. Yeah. And then there was an argument about. Um, why? And they reckoned that the uh, the Panther, uh, the, the, the German uh, the tanks, yeah. Panthers were rejoining there. Yeah. There wasn't any Germans in the city. Yeah. So it was the planes who bombed it. <laughs> it was a complete stuff up. Really. An unnecessary bombing. And civilians died, I guess. Yeah. On the yeah. yeah. It's a typical, uh, uh, you know, thing that happens in, in wartime. Friendly fire, they call it nowadays. Not very friendly, though, is it? <laughs> huh? Not very friendly. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But anyway, that's what happened, uh, yeah. as far as I know. And that's why you left, because of all the all, all the damage? Or? No, no, uh, no, no. Things were picking up really good by 1955. Mm. I mean, the Dutch are very resilient and all mm. that. But um, mm. uh, it's just my mother's idea. My, her, her youngest brother was in Australia at the time, mm. Mm. and uh, she decided that uh, it would be a good idea if uh, we picked up the family and mm. went to a, a young country mm. and start again. Yeah, good idea. Actually, there was a choice. Uh, at one stage, it was America, mm -hmm. and uh, depending on where her brother was going to go, he was talking about South Africa. Thank Christ, we never went there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd be here now anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably immigrate yeah. from yeah. from South Africa, yeah. yeah. Uh, in America, and Canada was another one. Mm. Mm. But because uh, uh, Uncle John decided to uh, settle in Ballarat, mm -hmm. Victoria, we came to Melbourne. Yeah. So how old were you then? I was the, uh, of the highly intelligent age of 14. 14? <laughs> so what did you make of Australia in... 1955. Loved it. Yeah. It was the country in the world. It is no longer is, unfortunately. Yes. I've watched getting fucking ruined. Right. This country has been bloody ruined over the the time that I've been here since 55. I mean, 55. The freedoms. Yes. We had. We have no longer. How long were you on the boat? Six weeks. Six weeks. Good six weeks. Uh. Got my mind thinking. Yes. Yeah. Everything changed. Yes. My whole attitude to life changed. Yeah. I sort of like uh, no longer had a future. Didn't mm. see one. Yeah. Just lived day by day after that. 
Yeah. It's been my philosophy ever since. Really? Never really? save any money. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. What's it for? What, next month? Yeah. Might be dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the age of that, at the age of 14, yeah. you can start anywhere. Yes. You know? Especially when you've just uh, reinvented yourself on a boat. Yes, which you wouldn't. That's basically what I did. I think I reinvented myself about three times in my time, you know. Coming from Holland originally, and uh, he was uh, a bit stressed about his Dutch accent, so he, he learned to speak Texas. He, he learned to speak America. And, and he spoke to me about that accent. And when he first came to Australia uh, in the very early days of, of migrancy, and we used to talk a bit about that because we we're both migrants. I mean, most white people, white skinned people in Australia are uh, somewhere down the track. And yeah. uh, and he had quite a thick accent, and and they used to get it would be difficult at school and socially that people couldn't understand his accent. Yeah. So he developed the American accent so that people could understand what he was saying. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Dutch's uh, understanding of language in general was very. And we'd have great, huge, long conversations over numerous uh, stubbies of beer. Yes. About. But Dutch language and words and Dutch and, and Latin and English and French and where words are derived from in history and mm. and uh, that was one of his interests was language. Yes. Yeah, you know. So he came off the boat, wanting to go, wanted to go to work. Yes. I was fourteen. Uh, leaving age was fourteen in those days. Yes. And uh, my old man wanted to send me back to college. Yeah. He wanted me to uh, study art of all things because then you know, I was not bad, not bad with the old. Uh, Pencils and inks. Yes. Um, and I said, now I want to go to work. Yeah. As I told you before, my so mother, the matriarch, uh, yeah. the boy wants to go to work, let him go to work. <laughs> and you were a tool maker, was it? No, no, I started off in a, in a timber yard. And, yeah. and then uh, from there, uh, uh, I went to Port Phillip Mills in Footscray uh, in the maintenance department. Mm -hmm. Learned how to handle lathes and Yep. Drills and all that machinery. And yep. Next thing you know, I'm putting the tools in myself, and next thing you know, I became a tool setter. I was just mm. basically taught myself. There you go. All the angles and the dangles and the whole damn things I'd forgotten about in school. Yeah. You could, <laughs> Automatically. You, you probably make your own guitar, probably. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Probably could, but why would I? You know, I'm missing that. <laughs> what, 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 what you... But other people make up a damn side better than I probably could. Yeah, well, that's Where would I get the wood from for a start? I never asked you about favourite guitars. Hmm? What about favourite guitars? Your, your first guitar and then your, your favourite guitar? My, my first guitar was a Ibanez FO. Yep. I, I paid five pounds for it. That's, you know, ten dollars, which in those days was sort of like... Uh, close to half of my weekly wage. Then I had a, a Hofner, mm -hmm. and then I had a, a Danish made guitar. What the hell was they called? Levin. Mm -hmm. Levin, which I turned into a nine string guitar. Yeah. Took it to work and drilled three extra holes at the top, and cut a banjo tailpiece. Stuck that in there and I had a nine string guitar. There you go, so you certainly customised a guitar. Yeah. yeah, ruined the bloody thing, I suppose. Uh, and I had Premier Electric, Maton Premier Electric, one of their earliest. It sounded like a, uh, like the American guitars, the K. Yeah, it had that sort of sound about it. And then I run up with a, a, a Guild Slim Jim. I had two of those. Yeah. Uh, what else did I have? Electric. A few other electrics. I had a Stratocaster, um, a Gibson Les Paul. Yes. Yeah, and then I had uh, several acoustic guitars, Takabine, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful guitar made in Japan. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful guitar. Yeah. Um, I took it to. Uh, Ian Noyce, the guitar, the luthier up in uh, Mount Clear, Ballarat, uh -huh. and uh, I wanted him to set it for me, and he had a good look in it, and he said, he said, this is an excellently built guitar. I said, well, I know it sounds excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Japanese. That, that was, was 
It was cheap back then. Uh, that would have been in the 70s. Uh, it would cost me, I think it cost me uh, $165. Which, uh, yeah, uh, and there were five of them uh, into five music company in, in, in the York Place in Little Burke Street. Right. Yeah. Um, he had five of them sitting there. Yeah. And I picked them all up and had to play and I kept coming back to the one, that particular one. Yeah. Yeah. And so I took that one home. Out of five, that was yeah. D1. Yeah. yeah. And you had that for how long did you have that? Oh, I sold it eventually to a friend. Yeah. Uh, I had to pay the taxation department for something. Yeah. <laughs> he had a semi-acoustic guitar, you know, so he played um, with a little amp on stage and and all that. He had an acoustic as well, but he really liked the uh, the, the electric because it was so general to play and he could do lots of really clever things on it. Like he used to do great Mississippi John Hurt sort of picks and stuff like that. I'll never forget when we played at the Promethean and I was fucking standing at the back and I went, what the fuck? And there was like a curtain at the doorway and he was he was playing all this beautiful fucking ragtime stuff, you know. Mm. Uh, 30s, 40s kind of fucking shit, you know. And he was singing and I was going, and I stood at the curtain and I was just fucking standing there fucking listening and going, fuck me swinging, this guy, he's fantastic. Just talking about the guitar that you're playing now. Yeah, J185. Yep. Gibson, yeah. Good guitar, you like that? Yeah, it's a lovely guitar. Yeah. yeah. How long have you had that? Oh, I've had it for about nearly four years now. Yeah. 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 Brand new. Yeah. Yeah. It was practically given to me by uh, 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 Gallons. Uh, yeah. Gallons uh, guitar shops. Yeah. Yes. Uh, AMI, I think, it's Australian Musical Instruments or something. Oh, yeah. It's the name of the company. Yeah. Yeah. So I was kind of sponsored by them. Yeah. Yeah. That's mm. a nice thing. Mm. Well, they'd be very pr privileged to have your name attached to it. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I'm, yeah. it just saves me a lot of money, that's all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that a guitar that you'd, you'd mentioned that you wouldn't mind, wouldn't mind having? Did you pick it out or they said, you know, this... Oh no! So they cool. sent me into the, they, they 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 got me to go into the store room mm. with about a thousand guitars hanging all over the place. And mm. I just picked a bunch of them out and checked them out, mm -hmm. and that was the one that uh, that I fancied. Yeah, wow. yeah. Well, that's pretty cool, Dutch. Mm. Yeah. That's the one I played at the uh, at the semaphore. Mm. Yeah, I'm quite happy with that. Yeah. Needs a little refret again already, because I'm so hard with the left hand. <laughs> Beatnik. I was a budgie. A beatnik. I was That's a budgie, cool. a beatnik, and a hip. <laughs> yeah. 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 Leather jackets, big blue jumpers, pig pants, blue suede shoes. And listening to rock and roll, I guess. 
Rock and roll, yeah. yeah. My favorite at that time was uh, uh, Fats, Fats Domino and, and, yeah. and Chuck Berry. Oh, yeah. They were my favorites, yeah. Yeah. And Tommy Tucker, there's a few of yeah. Tommy Tucker stuff about. Yeah. And uh, I've got, I got a bit interested in jazz as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Which, you know, sort of like all that crossover stuff. Yeah. Is, is, Anyone in particular with the jazz? Or? I used to kind of like, uh, uh, I used to kind of like uh, uh, people like um, uh, Dizzy Gillespie and, mm -hmm. and uh, Miles Davis uh, and Stan Kenton. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and uh, I got rather, uh, rather enjoyed uh, Woody Herman, Benny Goodman, mm -hmm. and then Count Basie became a yeah. big deal because you oh, know yeah. Count Basie was. His band was just a blues band, you know. Mm, yeah. <laughs> well, that's exactly right, because it was that real sort of bluesy sort of jazz oh, yeah. stuff. I love Kansas, that Kansas too. City blues, yeah. 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 So I like that stuff. Yeah. But, you know, we used to go to all these little rock and roll dances and, yeah. and the, jive. And now and now it's a whole bunch, I see a whole bunch of young people, they go to dance clubs to learn how to jive. Yeah. We were making it up in the spirit of the moment. You yeah, know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Beatnik, you, you wore a skivvy and, and, and a beret maybe? Or? Yeah, Barry grew whiskers. Yeah, uh, sloppy joes, corduroy, corduroy pants, desert boots. Yep, uh, duffel coats, uh, scarves around your neck. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. <laughs> you yep. do. You, you, most people do actually reinvent themselves. Yes. During a, a, their during their life. Yes. Until you settle for what what you reckon you're comfortable with. Yeah. Uh, and you, that's when you started writing poetry? I started yeah. writing, I started, well, I started writing songs, you yeah. know, basically. I started yes. writing songs. That's basically yeah. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you read Jack Kerouac and that sort of stuff? Ah, yeah, I read it twice, you know. Yeah. 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 The last time I, uh, the last was so about a year, about two years ago, I picked up uh, On the Road. Mm hmm I thought, my God, I enjoyed this shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, I'm not a big fan of that myself, but, but uh, you know, I guess it was the thing to do at the time, I guess. Yeah, I thought it was a lot of bloody rubbish. Yeah. So slow and so boring. So slow, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. But at the time, mm. I devoured it, mm. you know, back then. Mm. Yeah. And because it was really Ginsburg. And Ginsburg. Got my cart with a lot of tripe. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I actually thought I knew what it meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you were young enough to think you knew what it meant, I guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, then, and then after that, a, a hippie, what sort of stuff were you doing then? What was the, the hippie saying? Like? Oh, well, you had to read, you had to read, uh, uh, you had to read The Gobbit, The, 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 the Hobbit. The Hobbit, sorry. yeah. The Lord of the Rings, yeah. Yeah, but after The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, now forget it. After I read The Hobbit, I'm not, I wasn't going to go on with that fantasy. No? You know? No, I had enough of it. I was over it. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's but I, I read Rabelais stuff, yeah, like uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Gargantua and Pantagruel. Yeah, and understood? Absolutely. Ah, oh, well, it's easily to understand. It was, it's, uh, I, I don't know. It's a, a very interesting uh, stuff that was written in, where, where in the 1600s or something. Yeah. See, Rabelais, uh, Francois Rabelais was the guy that... Uh, um, uh, named cannabis, by the way. He was a he was a botanist. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, cannabis Fatima. He, that was that was his. He he, he named it. Yep. Uh, but he was a he was a uh, he was originally a priest. Yes. Um, he got defrocked and eventually he got excommunicated. Yeah, really. So he's a dead thing. Because some of the some of the stories he wrote in Pantagruel, uh, Gargantua and Pantagruel was. Uh, wasn't exactly uh, uh, very flattering to Rome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, the things he says about monks <laughs> and what they did to boys and oh, all really? that stuff. Yeah, right. Blowing the whistle way back then. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, it's just there's a beautiful story in it about uh, 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 Gargantua had been away to the war. Yeah. He comes back and tells his son he defeated because they were giants, you know, Gargantua and Pantagruel. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know how the hell they fitted in taverns, but because <laughs> they did, because they met people in taverns, really? you know. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. his his giant uh, um, his giant uh, war mare yeah. and him defeated the enemy by causing the whistling the horse and causing the the, the mare to piss. 
yeah. and she drowned th 3,452 of the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a weak bladder. Stuff like that, you know, like, I mean, yeah. it was just really ridiculous stuff. Yeah. Uh, and he was, he was under the influence while he was riding, I guess, so. Very like for all I know, he's probably drinking marijuana tea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, because they didn't smoke it in those days. They well, tea out of it, wouldn't they? Well, smoking, smoking wasn't a thing that people did, you know. Even when tobacco arrived, you know, smoking is no, not. They chewed it, of course. Yeah. They used to snuff it, you know. Oh, put it up of your nose. It was yeah. snuff, wasn't it? That's yeah. Right. Sorry. But uh, anyhow, uh, uh, then Pantagruel tells him that he had a problem while, um, uh, well, um, uh, Gargantua was away, uh, yeah. and I was wiping his bum, yeah. and, and it goes it goes through this great list of, of things he used to wipe his bum, <laughs> like ladies' handkerchiefs gave him a rash, <laughs> ladies' velvet hats gave him pimples, and it went on through all his buddy's stuff that he had a problem with the whole damn thing, until he discovered the value of the long neck of a downy goose. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't oh. see it. <laughs> I'll tell you what, he would have been desperate to find one when he needed one. <laughs> Maybe he had a supply. <laughs> had a big geese about <laughs> yeah. He didn't say. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that book. I remember it well. And then the other one I used to read was uh, uh, The Naked Lunch. Now, who wrote that? Uh, the Naked Lunch. Burroughs. Yeah. Yes. Burroughs, yeah. Yes, he was the other, the other uh, beat naked. Mm. Hippie writer. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we all read that. Yeah. And now, of course, there was always the novels. I was always an avid reader, so I still yeah. am. Yeah. Mm. What are you reading now? Well, actually, I'm just finishing a novel, and then I'm going to go on to part of its uh, little uh, story, uh, The World of My Past, which is all about uh, the Nazis and what they did to the Jews. Oh, right. I read Le Le uh, Primo Levi's book. He was an Italian Jew who, who had uh, some interesting things to say. Mm -hmm. So I'll have a read through that and see what more interesting things they have to say. Because mm. I've always been fond of Jews. I lived in a Jewish neighborhood. Oh, yeah. Uh, during the, when, I was, when I was a babe. Yeah. Yeah, and I could understand why, for instance, the Jews don't particularly like ambulances with that middle eight of, uh, of summer over the rainbow, dee, 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 that thing. They don't like that no? because that's what those gas trucks oh. are on to them. And they used to come to our neighborhood. And of course, my family knew that some of our friends were being taken away. Goodness. And they would be dead by the time they were around the corner. This is real, isn't it? Terrible, it was very terrible real. shit, that man. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. well, Rory always reckons, Rory always reckons, this will never happen again, yeah. but it's, it has. Yeah. <laughs> Stalin, mm. Pol Pot, mm. uh, now Mugabe. Mm. A very intelligent man, apart from all his blues, music that he's renowned for. He had an interest in everything that was going on in the world, and he was very well informed. You've always been a bit of a cynic? I've always been a sceptic about everything. Yeah, healthy thing to be. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When it came to Dutch, you certainly can't judge a book by looking at the cover. A very interesting and complex man. So when you're on the road touring, well, you spend hours and hours and hours staying in the same room, sitting in a car. You spend more time together than, than you would in, in other forms of work, where you go to your office and then go home. Six or seven years ago, I'd done a three-week tour with Dutch. Me, J Dutch and James T were all in the one car, touring around, and you know we'd all do our set and get up at the end and do four or five songs at the end of the night. and. He does talk a lot, Dutch, and I heard his whole life story since the day he was born to, to the, not the day he died, but not far off it, you know, and, but it was, it was a great privilege to, so I used to watch him in the late 80s, I'd go to festivals before I was performing, you know, and I'd, I'd sit there and watch Dutch, and he was one of the dudes I was, wow, check this dude out, you know, and then, then later on, you know, for my career and to be playing with him, you know, and getting to know him as a mate was um, right, yeah, quite yeah. overwhelming. And then, so many stories. But yeah, then we played, I think, about a year ago yeah. at a festival, and Cara met him. And I, I instantly loved him. Yeah. I mean, Fitzy was saying, oh, he's, I was, we've been on the road, he's, we're doing different festivals, and he goes, oh, you've got to check this band out, or this band, and <laughs> every band I've fallen in love with, you know, and Dutch Tilders was one of them, and that was really, Privilege to see him in such a close and up close and personal gig as well, you know. Um, 
yeah, I'm really, really glad I met him. When I went to see the Blues Club, you know, it, it was uh, it was Dutch with Barry Hills on bass, a, a guy called Peter Townsend uh, on drums, and Martin Cooper on on guitar, and uh, and I went to see Dutch because I'd, you know, I'd moved to Melbourne, as a young country boy, uh, interested in in blues guitar. And, uh, and I had my own little band called Just Blues and we, we got ourselves a couple of little residencies around town. Everywhere I played, people would talk to me about Dutch Tilders. They, they, they'd say, man, you, you should go and see Dutch. You know, if you're into the blues and, and you, know, you play okay, you, you should go and see Dutch. And uh, you know, to, to my great shame, I'd, at that point I hadn't heard of him. Uh, but I went along to the Windsor Castle on a Monday night and Dutch, Dutch would start up the gig. He'd, he'd just get up there solo and just just kick it off. And he's playing his big uh, semi-hollow noise guitar. I remember that. And uh, within I don't know two or three bars, I'd, I don't know, my jaw just hit the floor, and I just I, I knew I was seeing greatness. You know, this guy was he was the real deal. I knew a few guys around the place that. That were blues enthusiasts and, and you know we're, we're good at playing that you know versions of these old Muddy Waters records and Howlin' Wolf and stuff. But Dutch was he was the real deal. He this was a blues man, and uh, he'd obviously lived the life and, and could play this stuff. And I, I turned to my girlfriend at the time and I said, I have got to get to know that man. I, I have to know that man. Did you get to know him that night, or how long? Oh no, 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 no! I was I was too afraid to speak to him for how bold months, were you? Months, but I, I religiously went to uh, to the Windsor Castle uh, gig for a long time, but I just hung back. I, I didn't feel I was I was even ready to uh, uh, you know to speak to him, let alone ask if I could sit in. Because this was part of the gig that. Uh, that <laughs> Dutch would do the first set with the Blues Club. I know I was blown away by Martin Cooper as a guitar player as well. I used, I used to, you know, uh, you know, taking all these lead guitar solos and, so, and just how the whole band worked and how Dutch led it and took control. And he was very charismatic, you know, very, uh, uh, you know, people were just sort of drawn to him. Mm. And uh, yeah, he wasn't the po most polite guy. Was, uh, Chris and I were talking about it. If you didn't know him, you'd, you'd mm. just think he was a rude, <laughs> obnoxious, if you didn't uh, know he was a unpleasant person. Well, uh, well, it's uh, I don't know. There's so there's something about the way that he would tell you to fuck off <laughs> that you would take as a comp almost a compliment. Oh, Dutch told me to fuck off. <laughs> it's it's the context, and uh, when you know when Dutch would say fuck off, it it was like well. Go away, just get out of my side. It, it really wasn't meant to be uh, hurtful. I think it was just meant to be direct. It was just, meant to be final. Just, yeah, just say, well, no, sorry, but no. You know, I, I, I remember doing a, um, a sit-in with him at Goldburn, and uh, and I'd be playing with my own band in the in the other tent, and I went over to his tent, and and the uh, sound crew person there was setting up, you know. A DI for the guitar for Dutch to plug guitar in, and a, mm -hmm. and a microphone for Dutch. And they sent me a DI, and they just put a microphone in front of me. Well, when I played with Dutch, I never sang. I'd sing if I was opening up for him, but not, not when Dutch is singing. It's Dutch's stage, and he's singing. Mm -hmm. But he saw this mic there, and he said, "Hey, Willie, what's that?" <laughs> I said, well, "It's a mic, Dutch, but don't worry, I'm not going to use it." <laughs> 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 Oh, come on, let's have you be entertained tonight. Seriously, have you be entertained tonight. was a cantankerous old sod. Everybody knows how that Dutch. Well, what you saw was what you got. And, mm -hmm. and if you really knew him, that, that, that sort of bravado and that, that character that Dutch, I mean, in the end, Dutch just had to be Dutch, but he wasn't he, he wasn't play acting this Dutch, Tilda's character. Dutch was Dutch. And whether you were staying in his house or doing a tour with him or talking to him in a gig, what you saw was what you got. It was a genuine article the, the whole time. Yeah. Was he difficult to get on with? 
I never found him so. I always found him really encouraging and yeah. genuine and, and funny. open and yeah, funny man. He used to call me Blind Willie Fishface. There was a blues player, Blind Lemon Jefferson. And uh, so he'd call me Blind Willie Fishface, so I used to call him Crutch Ticklers instead of Dutch Tilders, and that was a little joke, you know. He never had a harsh word to say to me. He always made me feel like I had a place in that style of music and to keep working on what I was doing. He'd always find a pub and have jam sessions and bring musicians in and, and bring out the best in them and, and just get them up and uh, knew who to get up when. And, um, so you're talking about the Windsor Castle here? Or? The Windsor Castle was uh, was probably one of the greatest of all the ones that he had, I think. Uh, and everybody was eager to get up and play, but Dutch just knew who to get up, how long to have them up for, when to get the next person up. He, um, as much as he never ever wrote out set lists, you know, he, he would just get to a room and play. Uh, his residency strike rate was awesome and uh, None of us could do that, or a lot of us couldn't do that. We'd, we'd play a gig and, oh, yeah, you know. But Dutch always had regular work and always had a regular um, um, a following who just loved him, you know? I like to, th I like to think when I first started uh, playing and singing the blues, that most people thought the blues was a football team, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they used to think that uh, uh, Roy Robertson yeah. Sang the blues. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of course, nowadays they're just about everything is called the blues, you know. Yeah. Uh, but that takes us back to, say, for instance, the old uh, Black Swan records yeah. that had all these females that uh, sang these slow torch songs, which they called the blues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah not the blues at all. Yeah. Half of the stuff, more, uh, uh, half of the stuff that uh, Bessie Smith did is. Mm. Not a blues. Torch I do one of her, her famous ones. Uh, uh, nobody knows you when you're down or not. It ain't a blues. Yeah, yeah. Well, you sing it like a blues, you know. Yeah. 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 But it's not a blues. In fact, Bessie Smith was actually known as a torch singer, wasn't she? No, she was known in, as. In no, she was. She's the emperor, uh, empress, empress of the blues. blues. Yeah. 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 Was she from New Orleans or where was she from? She was a country girl. A country girl. So that's what happened. You see, the, it was the the country girls went to the city and brought and brought the blues with them. Yeah. Because only in the country that they sing the blues, they didn't play it in the city. Mm. No. Mm. That's how that came about. The music itself uh, is is ancient because it, uh, it's a lot older than than most people think. Mm. Uh, most people seem to think that uh, the blues started with uh, recording records, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, Papa, Char Papa Charlie Jackson was one of the last ones that still played the banjo, and of course that was the major instrument yeah. in the 1800s. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I came across a book once that uh, it was all about Negro spirituals, yeah. and uh, there was a chapter devoted to a music that was referred to as uh, blasphemous and bawdy. Yes. Which was sung by the Freeman. Yeah. See, the, the fellow that wrote the book on the Negro spirituals, he had notations and he had different variations of the same spiritual according to different plantations that he traveled through. Mm. He devoted a chapter to uh, uh, this music from the Freeman, mm -hmm. in other words, non slaves, mm. that worked on the docks, the levees, and the riverboats. Right. And they played banjos. Yeah. And he describes, he says that they sang about their. Their, their, their bosses, their women, and other conditions, um, and they, they played the banjos, and they sang a line, they make it up the spur of the moment, and they sang a line, and answer, answered it with the banjo, sang the same line again while they were thinking of the, the, the last line. Yeah. What's he describing? Yes. To our Bob Blues. <laughs> but music is a business, and... It is. When, when did you realize that you were able to, to do Music as your as your career. Ah, uh, well, it, it, it was never meant to be a career. No? I just sort of kind of fell into it. What happened was when I was about eighteen, I got myself a guitar, and I started picking the damn thing. And then, uh, and I, you know, I was always interested in, in blues music. Yeah. Uh, I was just, I was painfully shy. You know, I used to go up to ladies and say really stupid things. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but once I started picking that guitar at parties, the girls used to come to me and say stupid things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's much easier. So I thought, this is a good look here, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, I, you know, as I said, I played at parties, and then I wanted to play in one of the coffee lounges that was going on at the time. Whereabouts is that, in Melbourne? Or? In Melbourne, yeah, yeah, or around Melbourne. Yeah. And, uh, and this is in the 60s? Late 50s. Late 50s, yeah. late, fi late 50s, early 60s. So you were a teenager when you started playing these places? Yeah, I was about uh, 18 or something. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, anyway, I, I, was, I was a tool setter and, 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 uh, uh, up till 1972 when I made my first uh, record with uh, Bootleg. Yes. Um, I was I was doing a day job. You know, yeah. That was that was my thing. Um, and was that record really changed your life? Or? Well, not the actual record itself, but the touring with uh, the bootleg family. Mm -hmm. uh, starting tours like that, I I couldn't keep a day job no more. Yeah. And I, then I started to rely on uh, music for a living. And yeah. of course, in the in the seventies, uh, they were paying good money back in those days. You know. Yeah. Well, in in those days, I mean, that everybody go out to like um, pubs, you know. That that was where everybody went, and you know, or, or clubs. And there was no TV. There was, uh, you know, none of this fucking internet business. And uh, it's, so it was. It was just. It was all. Everything was live. Well, it was live music in fucking everywhere. Everywhere. It was just flat out. And it was fantastic time, like socially, you know. And, it was, uh, and everybody, everybody was moving everywhere, all pissed and stoned and everything, you know, from pub to pub to pub to pub, and there was a band playing in every pub, and, and it was just, and every pub was packed, and it was absolutely fucking stunning, yeah, you know. Yeah. I mean, some of the gigs that I, I do now, they, 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 they for what I get paid, uh, in in the nineteen seventies, if they gave me the same price, I would have laughed at them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and that, that's because of. The mainstream taste changing? Or? Yeah, no, everything has changed. I yeah, mean, yeah. Uh, you <laughs> you got a huge competition nowadays. You've got garage bands playing for sweet bug or nothing in 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 places. You know, mm. uh, 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 people seem to think that you know the boom crash is um, real music. <laughs> well, that's yeah, that's the big change, I guess. Uh, of course, the, the whole I, the whole thing was changed. I mean, the the, the, the quiet uh, folk coffee lounges disappeared, and the pubs took over. But uh, we had some really good bands around Melbourne that I can play in the middle of. Mm -hmm. right? Who were some of those? Hmm? Well, I used to uh, on a regular basis. I used to play with the Dingoes. Yeah. Um, uh, what I used to do uh, it was uh, I forget the name of the joint. I was in Carlton. Uh, the Imperial, I think. Yeah. Which, well, it wasn't called that then, but it's the Imperial Hotel. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the dingoes would open up, and then they'd take a break, and I'd do a solo thing, and then the dingoes would get back on again, and for the last set, uh, uh, Chris Stockley would drop out, and I would fit in, and we became the pubs, the pups. The pups, the, the dingo pups. pups. The yeah. dingo pups, yeah. <laughs> we call them, I don't know why they call that the pups, yeah. yeah. And that went on, I forget, it was. I think it was a Thursday night. Yeah. Um, it was always a full house. Yeah. And people didn't mind paying their uh, $5 to get in. Yeah. $5, which is about $25 today. Today, yeah. 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 Was he one of the guys who got you into the blues? Uh, yes, because he was... Like, I learned as much from local people as I did from overseas albums and that. Like, I learned as much from Matt Taylor and Dutch Tools and you know, those sort of people as, you know, Howling Wolf or Muddy Waters, because they were there, they were accessible, you know, and I, and I used to be able to see them play. And they were probably telling familiar stories. Yeah, yes. He left a mark on me when I was younger used to see him on TV, I thought he was totally unique, his guitar style and just the way he sang and he's a real blues man, real traditional blues man and I thought he was like nothing else. In fact, when I first seen him I thought this guy can't be living in Australia, just couldn't be, you know. 
He didn't. He just seemed like he was from somewhere else. You know? Another planet, or just another, another planet. And uh, at, the, at the end of the uh, the gig, when we all played and uh, said goodbye, he said, "Keep the faith." <laughs> now, I wasn't pretending that I was bosom buddies with him, but he was a constant in the blues scene in Melbourne as I was coming up. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had enough. Yeah. I had enough. Interaction with him to be influenced by his attitude and his love of that music, you know, and he could bloody well play. I remember going to see him before I was in bands, you know, like at places like the Station Hotel in Peran. We'd trot up on a Saturday afternoon and he'd be there playing. And I think Jeff Atchison might have just started in his band. All my best meetings with him were over at Kevy's joint when he started seeing. Same with me. Mate, Kevy Freeman. And we'd be sitting around just, and it, I really didn't have much of an idea because I, I was just thinking about it <coughs> the other day when, uh, uh, fuck it, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago, uh, KB and Dutch did a record called The Blues Had a Baby. Oh, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. And Fair they did big national tours like several times and, and it, was, it was fucking big. Yeah. And they went on for quite a long time with that. It was kind of organised by um, the guy who wanted to produce the record. He wanted to do a um, direct-to-disc thing, and um, and he had Dutch on side, I, I presume, at the time. And I just got the call. Did you want to do it? And I thought, yeah, I'd love to do it. And especially in that it, idiom of, um, you know, having to play it once right through the whole the whole side of the record without stopping and doing a track stop, and going to the next song and doing it like that, straight to um, cutting. If you screwed up right at the very last track or something and it was, you know, hope or the band didn't think it would be like, well, something went wrong, you'd have to start again. You know, you wanted to get good takes. The little things would happen. I lost my slide on one time. We came to the solo and uh, the slide had rolled off the amp and gone down underneath and it was like it was coming to the gap um, of the, to do the song. <laughs> and I'm looking for my slide and I'm going, oh, oh the pressure. <laughs> and looking under here. <laughs> and it came out with the same. This is definitely before one of the slide songs. There's a slightly longer gap where so I'm that usable, fishing. <laughs> that was a usable take. Hey? That was a usable take. Yeah. I provided a little bit more space, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then that was followed by, by a, uh, quite a substantial tour. Yeah, well, we had um, the guys I must mention um, John Watson played the drums, mm. great drummer, and Michael Deep played the bass, who they were both playing with me at the time. Mm -hmm. So they hooked into my rhythm section kind of thing and me. And, you know, it was great because I, um, I really respected Dutch and um, wanted, we wanted to back him as authentic as we could, you know. Mm -hmm. yep, yep. And you all went on the tour? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Quite a big tour. Yeah, it? yeah, it was um, right around. Can't remember a, a hell of a lot, it was so long ago, but I can remember doing uh, the Mwilumba Hotel and just people the windows were open and there was people hanging through the windows and it was just so crowded mm. and people really digging it. It was a really successful tour and the idea of it being recorded like that um, was unique and you know for for Australia. Yeah. Now all all the pubs there's, there's, there's free music. Yeah. Yeah. I call it music. Yeah. Yeah. But it costs you nothing to go in there and get yourself up mm. off your face while the boom crash band is happening. You know. Well, they don't really <laughs> care anyway. What? Mm -hmm. They don't care what's happening. No, they wouldn't care. <laughs> and I guess that's the big thing with somebody like the 74 Workers is that you've got an audience that, that are really there to appreciate the music. And they have to pay to get in. Yeah, <laughs> they, they do. And, and I gather that they, uh, it's one of the better paying um, uh, places to, to, to play. Uh, well, I do the door deal there, so yeah, yeah. what comes in is mine. The, the door's basically yours, that's, yeah. that's right. Mm. And of course, you get, you know, obviously a, pretty much a, a full house, I guess, as far as they can fit in. Yeah, but it's usually uh, uh, a couple of hundred people there. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And they love it. Yeah. They do. Yeah, they yeah. do appreciate it. I mean, when I do a really nice, quiet, soft one, they actually listen. Mm. So a lot of places, people just... Uh, oh, I've played in pubs where they've got they've got the screen on there and the football's on. <laughs> and they're going, Whoa! <laughs> oh, oh, okay, thank you very much. I'm just doing a really nice, gentle little song, and I'll also get this bloody roars, roaring noise going on. Yeah, uh, uh, that's very uh, pisses me right off. Actually, it would. And uh, uh, 
places like that, unless the management turns the bloody thing off, I just won't even go on there. Yeah. Tell them, no, nah, you got that on? I'm not playing. Yeah. Well, so, you're um, surely be respected enough that you could pretty much call the shots, I guess. Yeah, I do it. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've done it in the past. I pulled the plug on things. Just, yeah. Yeah. See you later. Yeah. Stick your money up your ass. Yeah. And both he and I would hate shopping centres and just refuse to do them and stuff like that. I also remember an amazing incident when, when the entire symphony, Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, everyone was involved with this big, big jingle. Uh, that the Because we used to do those kind of things too. We'd get farmed out to do, because we were sort of well-known characters in this stable, where well, we'd go out and do jingles and stuff, you know. Um, I remember Dutch walking out because he, halfway into the first... Uh, uh, words that he looked at on this uh, cheat sheet for the uh, for this uh, song he'd been asked to do a blues version was for Coca Cola and the immortal words were I ain't singing no fucking song for Coca Cola <laughs> <laughs> and he was gone you know like he's just unbelievable he was worse than me we both had attitude problems but he was t he was unbelievable we, we toured as the Woodley family uh, yeah. there was uh, Brian Cap the band of Telebini. yeah. Uh, who else was there? Uh, well, Stephen Foster, myself, uh, Carrie Bedell. Yep. Uh, uh, who was that other player in the bootleg family? Oh, that he hadn't mentioned was Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. And who was Mississippi? Well, turned into LRB, basically. Mississippi was, um, at that stage, Colin DeLuca played the bass, Peter Curtin was the drummer. Graham Goble was the songwriter and rhythm guitarist. B. Bertles was the uh, uh, rhythm guitarist and close on. And, uh, sorry, um, um, not Rick Formosa, the other guy who died two years ago here. Russ Johnson was the guitar player and co-writer. They went over to um, Melbourne as Alison Gross from here, a uh, folky type band and then they uh, formed Mississippi there. So they had John Mower was the main singer. Because Graham basically sings high harmonies, he always had to have a front singer. That's why Glenn ended up being in LRP and, and, uh, and, and uh, John later, John Farnham. Um, so it was John Mower was the singer. Uh, Russ Johnson was the guitar player, amazing guitar player and, 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 and good songwriter as well. Uh, the rhythm section, as I said, was Colin DeLuca on a fretless bass and, uh, and Peter Curtin on drums. Um, and uh, for a while they had Harvey James, who we lost a little while ago as well, a lovely man, used to be with Sherbert. Uh, after the Berkeley, after the Mississippi period when we toured with, so he was their guitar player after Russ left, you know. So, but Graham Goble was the main person in the band, the song, and they wrote. He wrote "Kings of the World," which was the biggest single and got the most airplay of anything that Bootleg ever put up there, even more so than anything that Brian did. I think yeah. Peter Jones was the uh, musical director. Yeah, piano player. Uh, yeah. And you, you toured all over the place? Yeah, we went all over Australia. Yeah. How long for? Uh, for about six months. Yeah. Yeah. No, six months, four. Yeah. You know, but. Uh, yeah. Mm. What was it like being on the road with those guys? A bit like a steam train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because you were, what, what sort of age? Oh, I would have been uh, 30. Uh, 32, 33. Yeah, so just starting to really hit your straps? Hmm? Just starting to really hit your straps as far as? Ah, oh, well, it was, a, it was an interesting experience, uh, the fact that all this touring business that was going on, and, uh, yeah, the, 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 <laughs> yeah we, um, we all got along, hmm. which is an important thing. Yeah. And uh, then I learned, you know, from that I learned touring with people like Taj Mahal and yeah. McGee and uh, uh, John Mayle, I toured with him. Yeah, yeah. Um, you get the idea of what's expected of you, you know, and, yeah. and uh, how to uh, not get too, uh, too tired, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got to pace yourself or...? Uh... Yeah, you got to. Uh, yeah. You have to, otherwise... I mean, there's always partying going on after these damn shows. So, yeah. and, and, and in most places, it, you, you have to be out of your room at 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I had ten times you, you, you've got to be on the road by eleven anyhow. Yeah, yeah. In order to you know uh, get to your next gig because Australia is a big place, you know. Yeah, yeah. And all the gigs are a long way apart. How were you travelling? Oh, a lot of them by train, some by buses, and sometimes uh, just by cars. Yeah. You know. Yeah. 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 So you, know, you have to think in terms of um, you've got to get yourself some sleep, and if you can't do that, well, you get a helper. Yeah, yeah. So when did you pop, first pop, pop a little helper? And <laughs> yeah, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when did you first get um, management? Our actual management was uh, Les Simmons from Eureka Records. Oh yeah. Because by uh, uh, 1974, uh, they uh, Bootleg wanted me to do another album. And, and stick with them, but I couldn't handle it. Uh, they were, they were, it was just not my league. A, uh, they were, yeah, it, it was not suited. Mm -hmm. I, was, I, was, I wasn't suited to them. They thought I was suited to them, but I didn't think so. Yeah. So I quit, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I didn't take up the option. Mm -hmm. And in 1975, uh, an old friend of mine from uh, that I knew back in France, and, he decided to set up uh, Eureka Records, yeah. and I did uh, four albums for Eureka Records, mm -hmm. and uh, Les Simmons became my manager, yeah. record boss manager, the whole damn thing. Mm -hmm. Things wouldn't get him down for very long before he'd either get grumpy or he'd get on top of it. Finished in uh, 81, 82, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I don't think, I, and I had no management from there on in. I had no management for a little while till Helen Jennings mm -hmm. came along. She had cliffhanger promotions once she didn't have it. She was always uh, taking phone, phone calls from. Uh, from uh, uh, jazz orientated promoters and saying mm -hmm. who could they get for such and such a gig and she, would, and she was doing it for nothing and I said, mm -hmm. I said you gotta, if you're going to do this you're going to have to charge him mm -hmm. you know if you're going to keep doing this this is costing you phone calls and mm -hmm. you're making other people money you should get money out of it you know and next thing so, so she became my manager yeah mm -hmm. that was up to uh, about 1980 mm -hmm. 81 or something, and um, uh, anyway, that, 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 that uh, dissolved, mm. so I didn't have a manager until uh, about 19, well, it was about 1990, I think, when I uh, mm. uh, met Lynn Wright. Mm -hmm. She had uh, Peanuts promotions, and, mm -hmm. and she decided to look after me, so and that was a good thing. Very good thing, yeah. Mm. Yeah, she looks after me pretty well. Well, you're lucky there. Mm. Is it hard to find a, a good good manager? Or? Oh yeah. yeah, it's very hard to find a good manager. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you get a, a really good manager uh, who tends to help himself a bit more than than than, than, than me. So like <laughs> you get that as well, and you got to be careful. How much of your career do you have to look after, or does pretty much peanuts 
looks after for you? Well, I don't want details, you know. Like I don't, I don't like to get my uh, my psych disturbed by mm. financial details. So yeah. I let her handle it. <laughs> well, that, that that's the thing that you want. If you can find someone who's going to do it well, then. I often get people, they, they, they ring me up and they say, I want you to play in such and such a place. I say, well, you talk to my manager. Now we, we don't want to deal with the manager. If you're not dealing with my manager, you're not dealing with me. Yeah. Well, how much would you charge? And I said, ask my manager. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually they do. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Well, that, would, that would be the nice thing about having a manager, I guess. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to tell them how much I want. Yeah. You get, you get somebody who, who who is not embarrassed to ask for yeah. more yes. than what I'm likely to get. That's right, because you're the creative type. Let them do the haggling. Yeah, because <laughs> that would be a real pain. Yeah. And having to get the money as well. Hmm? And having to go and get actually get the money as exactly. well. Exactly, yeah. To do that for yourself would be a real yeah. pain, yeah. But it's an educated audience at, at that workers' club, isn't it? Oh, yeah, they, they know their music. Yeah. Yeah, oh. they know their music. But, you know, they're, they're working class people. Yeah. 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 They're not the ones that can afford to two hundred dollars to go and see BB King. Huh. But they know the blues. <laughs> they know the blues. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. And they've got their collections and they, you know, they're they're the Rolling Stones uh, the Rolling Stones uh, chain mm. uh, that kind of mm. music would be in their collection. Yeah. What's in your collection? Uh my collection. Uh, <laughs> what I got left I was um Big Blue Brunsey, Lighton Hopkins, Ray Charles. Yeah, yeah. You know, Ray Charles and Big Blue Brunsey were my two favorites. Mm. And, uh, of course, you know, Ray Charles was actually, according to him anyway, it was actually influenced originally by Big Blue Brunsey, which was yeah. my major influence. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I can, I can hear it in Ray Charles. Yeah. You know? How did you first hear, hear Big Bill Brunsey? Who, who had that? About 1958. Yeah, and that was someone had the record and you said Yeah, yeah, I just fell in love with that guy. You know? Yeah, just yeah, loved the way he played. Was that a friend or? Yeah, it was a friend of mine had, had had Bill in his collection. He had a lot of other stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. He brought it over from England. Yeah, and uh, so I went looking for Brunsey's recordings. The nearest thing I could find was Josh White. <laughs> I don't know Josh White. Do you don't know about Josh White? No. Mean Mistreater, mean mistreater, songs like that. I I actually toured with Josh White Jr., who yeah. doesn't sing anything like his father, yeah. except he does the Mean Mistreated Blues, which was uh, Josh Josh's big thing, and and a one meat ball song. Yeah. <laughs> one meat ball. <laughs> one meat yeah. Ball. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he was a lovely fellow, Josh White Jr. Yeah. Liked his beer. He was yeah. a good fellow to get along with. Yeah, yeah. He used to get awful damn drunk together. Yeah. Uh, he said one day we were going to have, uh, if we get a chance, we're going to have, see who could drink, who under the table. Uh, but I kept always thinking, every night I drink you under the table. <laughs> <laughs> he just couldn't remember. <laughs> did, did you ever... Um, Drink before playing, or was it always drink before so playing? Oh, I can't yeah. think until I've had a drink. It yeah. don't come alive to a point of fire. <laughs> I'm 
One of those things that that happened as you were uh, living this this life of seizing whatever came along. I mean, along came lots of interesting people like Brandy. Well, McGee yeah. and I became very good friends. I and, uh, mm. That's why I wrote that song, uh, "Keep to Faith," because he always used to say, "Actually, I'm called to keep." It. It's called McGee's advice, but because uh, yeah. uh, I can't call it "Keep to Faith" because there's already a song titled that. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, McGee always used to say, keep the faith at the end of a telephone call or at the bottom of his letter. And, uh, and I remember, you know, throwing a tizzy in some production that we were doing where everybody was really pissing me off. Um, and I made a lot of noise about it. And McGee just turned around and said, oh, it'll be all right, it'll be all right, just keep the faith. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right? Yeah, well, it did turn out all right, but yeah. um, so I thought, no, he never wrote that song, so I thought it was a good idea. Maybe I write it. And you did. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> How did you actually get to know him? How did you come to? I met him uh, through a friend. Hmm. Uh, he, uh, he happened to be a friend of mine, but he was also a friend of Brownie's. And when Brownie was here in 1972, I think, um, he, uh, my friend Tomo, John Thompson, mm. got hold of him and brought him after the show, brought him back to my place where we had copious amounts of beer and scotch. Yep. Um, sat around playing guitars and, and having a hell of a lot of fun. Yep. And uh, from there on in, uh, when, whenever a Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee came to Australia, it was Brownie insisted I, I open for him. Yep. So I wound up touring with him. Fantastic. And eventually, of course, when Sonny died, Jimmy Conway became the harmonica player in Australia for him. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, we did all this touring and we became really good friends. Fantastic. Anybody remember Brownie McGee? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Ronnie, of course, was, uh, was a good friend of mine, and he always used to finish at the bottom of the letter that he wrote. He would say, "Keep the faith." And at the end of the telephone call, he was, "Keep the faith." And if I spat the dummy about something going wrong on tour, he said, "It'll be all right, Doc. Just keep the faith." I have no idea why I never wrote the song, so I decided to write it for him. And I'd like you to all sing along with it tonight. It's a very simple song. I'll, I'll line it for you. <laughs> I've actually uh, won an award for one of my songs. I don't know what it was now. I can't remember. Was yeah. it? Uh, I've got awards a load of ruddy places. Yeah. Some of them would be very good for doorstops. <laughs> yeah. His own songs are fantastic. I mean, our debut albums were full of our own songs. He did a couple of covers, I did a couple of covers, but generally they were our songs, they were our version of it. And some of his songs, he's always had a, a bit of a wry sort of sense of humour as well and very self-deprecating. You, did you start off copying some, someone's style or did you pretty much invent your own thing? Well, I, 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 I started off trying to copy Big Will Bruinsy, but I didn't get it right. Yeah. So, uh, the bits I didn't get, get right, well, they're mine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah. <coughs> I don't actually sit down to write a song. Yeah. It just comes to me, you know, and yeah. I write down a line. Yeah. 
And I think, okay, now I'm going to think of a, of, of a riff that might, that, that might go with that. Yep. And um, sometimes I actually sing it twice and mm. then forget it altogether. Yeah, yeah, but some stick. Some of them, uh, three or four songs become one song. Yeah. And, and have you liked the versions that people have done of your music? I've heard uh, a couple of bands doing uh, um, bad books. Yeah. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the most important point, and the biggest point Dutch ever made to, to me and other people around me, and I, and I heard him do it a lot of times, was to say to people, sing about your own life. <laughs> Six years. Yeah. Six, no, I've been lived in this area for about eight years altogether, yeah. yeah. Mm. Do you like the lifestyle? Or? Oh, it's good for me, yeah. yeah. I can handle well, it. you got your ravens? And... i got my ravens, i got my pond, and yeah. sometimes I get sunshine even. Yeah, well, maybe in a month or so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they... well, the pub just down the road. Yeah. Convenience store not far away. Yeah. No, and I guess you still... Um... <coughs> You still fly all over the place, I guess. So, hmm? where where you base? So, do you play around Melbourne a lot, or do you? Not very much. Uh, state, I, I, I do most of it away from Melbourne. Hmm. Uh, like, uh, well, I, I, I'm going to Ment uh, to Mordialic for my next gig, mm -hmm. and then another one I got an upway way. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's Wangaratta coming up, and then I've got to go to New South Wales. And mm -hmm. uh, recently, I was in Adelaide, yep. and uh, yeah, that's basically what I do. <laughs> Story. <laughs> yeah, well, you got enough of them. Doesn't matter if you forget yeah. a few, I guess. Yeah. 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 Uh, forget the shit. Just remember the good bit. Oh, that's good. Mm. Well, that, that'll be heaven. If you can take your memories with you, that'll be. Yeah. Well, some of them are going to be written down, so I'll leave some behind. Yeah. Mm. Eventually. 
Well, you know, I mean, uh, there's only one many Dutch Tilders, I guess. And uh, the character... And the world is very happy. Yeah, <laughs> but you, you created that character. Any, right? any more than one, it might be a little bit of a burden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that's, that's a pretty special, unique thing to, to create a, a, a name that's, that's known. It must feel a bit strange too, I guess, to... Uh, I've never noticed any drawbacks. So. No. no. Well, it wouldn't, be any, it wouldn't be any drawbacks. It'd just get you all those ladies' attention, <laughs> you know, which would have been fabulous, I guess, over the years. You want to reel off the, the names of all the women or or leave that? Uh, I think we won't go there. <laughs> no worries, Dutch. thing that you've uh, come to come to realize or well the all, all I all I all I can think of is this you only live once hmm. live it to the fullest absolutely well Dutch Tilders thank you very much it's been an absolute pleasure <laughs> better go on Derek <laughs> keep the faith So
say goodbye and I'm going how in the fuck am I going to say goodbye to <laughs> someone you know, you know so you just ring up and see what happens you know and he was so cool about it and philosophically funny about the whole thing and, um, and I said I said well you know have a good journey and I'll see you there <laughs> Fantastic. you know and did he say uh, keep the faith yeah <laughs> Yeah, I'm thankful I got, I got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I wound up playing with with, uh, with Dutch for about six years, you know, until the mid '90s, and then you know, until the point where I, I uh, decided I, I had to go on and do other things. And, um, and that was kind of painful, <clears throat> leaving the band. How did Dutch take it? Uh, we we actually oh, actually Dutch was fantastic. He, he you know, his words to me at one point he said, "Well." So I'm surprised you stayed with me as long as you did. <laughs> so he made it really easy for me. But, yeah. um, uh, but I, I found it really difficult, and I probably stayed for longer than than I should have because I was just, you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a songwriter, and and I put my, my own band together. I've got I've just got my own musical ideas and my my own. I've just had my own path to go on. And Dutch knew that. You know? and I think he's known that with most people that have that have worked with him. Oh, he probably wouldn't have worked with you. Hmm. So, uh, look, it's, it's just just a chapter of my my career that I, I cherish because I, I I not only got to got to um, got to meet that man and, and and got to know him a little, got to share a beer with him, got to talk about blues music, but I, I got to work with him and and I have a you know I have, and I have that uh, 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 working relationship that. that went on for a very long time. You were part of his journey. Mm. Jeff Asherson, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Derry. Cheers.